18 years ago, I established uh, an organisation in the UK which was about trying to encourage people to live more sustainable lifestyles. I was sort of an incredibly arrogant 30-year-old and I thought, this has got to be easy. All I've got to do is to persuade people that taking simple steps in their lives will help them save money and will benefit the environment. What could be easier? I spent 18 years discovering how wrong I was and this photograph for me demonstrates the, the brilliant stupidity of people. These are people getting the escalator to go to their gymnasium. And all of us, I think, have a picture in our minds of what we're like. And advertisers know that we all have these, these self-images, and they play on those self-images. So, you know, we need the latest technology, even though the technology we've got already works. Perhaps we take up smoking, even though we know it damages our health. Um, perhaps we buy stuff, even though we know we've got absolutely no money to buy it. And these sort of self-images that we create mean that we're not very open to rational, logical uh, behaviour change advice. And I've spent 18 years trying to work out how you can cut through this sort of heavily driven uh, consumption culture that we have and persuade people to live more sustainably. And what I wish I'd done 18 years ago was had an instruction manual to help me do that. Um, I finally realised after all this time that instruction manuals are actually quite useful. It would have saved me a lot of grey hairs it would have saved a lot of time and hassle and heartache for the poor souls who've joined me on this journey. So what I was going to do today is, is talk about what would be in my instruction manual and how we can encourage people to live more sustainably. And the first piece of instruction in my instruction manual would actually come from Peter, who's sitting in the audience. Uh, I'll shorten his story. Peter tells incredibly long stories. That would take up my full 18 minutes. But my short version of his story is this. He said, Trillian, imagine you're going to a wedding um, of your friends uh, and you're gathered together at the church and they've chosen some songs for you to sing. And the pianist starts up and there's silence. And then two or three people will start singing, usually very loudly and usually totally off key, but they'll start singing. Once those people start singing, the majority of the people in the church hall will then join in and start singing with them. Uh, and then you always get the very clever ones at the back who just mime their way through the whole process. And that's how change happens in any community. In any community, you need to find those brave souls who will start singing. You need to give them the confidence, the ability, the authority to enable them to start to make a noise. And gradually, they will persuade their peers, be it in a workplace, in a home, uh, in a school. Gradually, you'll get them to change. So my first lesson in my book is find those singers, find those champions. And they come from all over the place. This is Adam Yassir. Uh, he's originally from Sudan. He went to a school in Croydon in London. Anybody who saw the London riots would have seen terrible photos of Croydon burning during the London riots. Adam set a very different ignition to his school. He actually brought about change in his school under the campaign title, The Green Hope, he worked on a thing which said, tomorrow's climate is today's challenge. And thanks to his enthusiasm and his dedication and his spark, he was enabled to get the college to start to introduce things like green ICT, uh, behaviour change programmes, and actually started to transform the way that the college works. So time and again, we've seen in different walks of life, in different communities, champions like Adam <coughs> who start singing and start creating the change. So that would be my first lesson. But the second thing is, you can't create change on your own. You need to do it in groups. The environmental movement has been terrible at having a really talking head approach to its messages. So you get sort of people going, you should be doing this, you ought to be doing that. Um, it's a really sort of difficult way to communicate because the immediate response is, what rights have you got to tell me how to live my life. Oh, and by the way, what are you doing in your life um, on these issues? And basically, we need to change the whole way that communication takes place about sustainability and environmental messages. And if you get groups of people together, you get a completely different sort of conversation. People start challenging each other. People ask questions. People learn from each other. And change happens. So, for example, if you get households together, they start saying, actually, we could share land. 
we could share skills, we, we could think about doing things differently. I heard about one woman who every night sent her poor husband out to put the night water, pee, on the compost bin because she knew it speeded up the whole process. And she actually, in the group, suggested that all the other neighbours did exactly the same. I don't know whether they actually took up the suggestion or not, but I think it would have brought a totally new dimension to neighbourhood watch schemes. <laughs> and nowhere do you get that energy more than amongst young people. And I feel passionate that we should give young people a much greater voice in this whole debate. We are the decision makers at the moment, creating the climate that they've got to live in. All, every tonne of carbon that we take out of an atmosphere is one less that they have to play with in their lives. And yet they're not involved in the decision making. So I've spent a lot of my time trying to give young people a voice and a position in this, this, this discussion so that they can make their views felt. And I've been amazed about how fantastically articulate and brilliant the suggestions of young people are when they come together and how they can translate that into really simple activity. So here's a group of young people. They decided they wanted to cut carbon. They worked out that if people pump their car tires up to the right pressure, it saves carbon. They wrote to all the local supermarkets and said, we'll do a scheme in your car park where we will pump your, your customers' car tires up while they're shopping with you and we'll help them save money and they'll have safer cars. Brilliantly simple. The supermarkets loved it. They were helping their customers save money while they were shopping. And at the same time, it got a great message across and enabled young people to start to communicate uh, the, the important issue about climate change in a different sort of way to those that we've seen before. And communication is really, really crucial to this whole thing. We're dealing with massive, abstract, confusing issues like climate change. And it's very hard for people in their daily routines to link those massive issues with the things that they can do in their daily lives. So somehow you have to bring it to life. Somehow you have to give them a connection. So what happens if you go into your beautiful office and you're confronted with a tower of waste paper and nobody's told you why it's destroying your lovely atrium? Well, that's the amount of paper that this business was throwing away in a week. And what they did was that they used this iconic image in their own offices to start communicating about the changes that the business should be making to start to become more sustainable. And they saw a massive reduction in, in waste uh, as people started to talk about it and as it created the conversations that are so needed to drive things forward. And you can really help people to make connections in other ways. This is a, we have a portable um, uh, sort of torture unit called a carbon gymnasium, which we take around the UK. And when you jump on one of these bikes and start pedalling, it powers different electrical appliances. So you can feel how much careless energy, carelessly leaving on, that, that energy monitor uses by actually powering it with your legs. And again, it's a great way to get a conversation going with a different audience, particularly blokes, because we have a competition which is, OK, how much energy can you generate by cycling? And they get really competitive about the whole thing. But making um, the intangible tangible would definitely be one of my sort of things that I wish I remembered. Another thing I wish I'd remembered, or knew even, was somebody's rule. I don't know who came up with this rule, but it's a great rule. If you have a brilliant decision in the pub, it doesn't necessarily translate into a brilliant decision the next day. So um, I realised this when I was doing a spoof, who wants to be a millionaire, in front of a load of MPs, thinking, this is dying badly. So my rule would be, if you have a brilliant decision in the pub, check it's a brilliant decision the next day. And likewise, if you have a brilliant decision in the day, go to the pub and see if it's still a good idea then. I don't, that probably doesn't work so well, but it's nice and social. <laughs> and I occasionally get carried away with my enthusiasm. So I got really cross uh, in, the, in the early 2000s in the UK when we were bombarded by lifestyle programs. So, you know, how to decorate your house, how to cook, how to garden, how to do everything in your daily lives. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we just spun that message and put a sustainability angle onto it? So, you know, yeah, you want to do all those things, but actually do them in a slightly more sustainable way. So uh, I went about and I created a sustainable lifestyle magazine called Ergo in the early 2000s. It was fabulous. It was everything I wanted to be. It had great stories. It was positive, etc., etc., etc. 
Um, but it was way too soon for its time. So we couldn't get anybody to advertise in it. It was a financial disaster. And then when we did get it into a bookstore, I was so delighted. I went to the chain of bookstores and I thought, right, I'm going to find my magazine. And I went and I looked in the conservation section and it wasn't there. And then I thought, ah, oh, it'll be in Lifestyle. And I went to Lifestyle and it wasn't there. And basically I trawled my way through the entire bookstore until I found it nestled in the gay porn section. I have no idea why it was there, but really nobody else knew what it was about. And so my next lesson is, you know, don't get over ambitious in what you're trying to do. Uh, have the rationality of the sober moment when you think, actually, is this a good idea? And the next thing I wish was in my instruction booklet was to think about the organisation I was running. So when you start an organisation, you're on your own, you're sort of like out there, you're battling against everybody and you're fighting and you're stubborn and you're energetic. And then you start to attract people around you. And they tend to have similar qualities. And you have a soul of your organisation and an energy. And then the organisation starts to grow and you think, oh gosh, finance is looking a bit, bit, bit large now. Perhaps we need a financial expert or perhaps we need a marketing expert or perhaps we need an expert on running programmes. And gradually what you do is, is you disperse the energy and the soul and the vision of the organisation and you start bringing in specialists who are there perhaps for very other reasons. And what I wish I'd done right from the start was to make sure that everybody in the organisation retained the passion, the energy and drive and the charisma which actually made the organisation what it is. And I think you can very quickly fall into the trap of over-professionalisation. I'm obviously not saying that you know, you must be professional, obviously, but you can over-professionalise. And so that would definitely be in my rule book. <coughs> but I think the one overwhelming message that I've got is to think about what we're talking about. So um, the famous speech didn't start with I had a nightmare, did it? It started with I had a dream. And I've been involved in um, Al Gore's recent climate reality initiative and I look at it, and it's 160 slides of doom, gloom, and despondency. It's beautiful. It's like getting hit over the head continually with a fish. It's like, oh, God. Is that the way that we really are going to engage with people and get them involved in this, this discussion? I really don't think it is. I think somehow we have to talk about all the positive th things that are about a sustainable lifestyle. We need to talk about more local resilience, we need to talk about better jobs, we need to talk about security of energy supply, we need to talk about greener spaces, stronger communities. All of those things for me are the heart and soul of sustainability. And I think we tend to get slightly lost uh, in the doom and gloom, despondency, oh we've got to cut carbon by what's carbon by this much and we've got to do these things. And I think we've got to be much clearer about the message and that's one thing I'd really wished right from the start that I could have articulated much better what I see as a very positive and bright future rather than going out without and heading back to the war years which is the, 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 the dialogue that I hear so frequently from environmental organisations. So those, those are the rules for me that I'd wished I had um, right at the beginning. But one thing that's come out of, of this journey for me really clearly is that the more I understand the science, the more I see what's happening, the more I realise the absolute imperative to act on the environmental challenges we face. Uh, I've got young children. To me, they must have the same opportunities, the same chance in life that, that I've been privileged to have. And what I see is the lifestyles and the way that we're consuming uh, things at the moment we're taking away those opportunities from them. And I actually think that's morally wrong and that we need to do something about it. So the one big take home from me from this message is that I'm going to keep going. I'm still going to ignore the rule book because what I've done is I've learnt through doing, learnt through failing. I'm going to keep on doing that because I passionately believe that we need to create the change to lead a much more sustainable life in the future. Thank you.